and welcome back, Discovery Learners, to another episode of Ability to Learn from the Discovery Day program. It is I, Teacher Liz, here, your host once more, on today, Thursday. On this episode, we're going to go over some observances, interesting history, I'll be showing you some cool landmarks, animals, pretty plants, and of course, some interesting facts. Let's not delay any further. Let's start the show. And now for our daily observances. Hey, Discovery Learners. It's Substitute Teacher Andrew here with a whole new list of observances today. The first observance is National Peace Rose Day. Each year on April 29th, National Peace Rose Day honors a well-known and fruitful garden rose. The light yellow large cream-colored flowers of Peace Rose have slightly flushed crimson peak petal edges. It's a hybrid tea rose that is hardy, vigorous, and highly resistant to disease. As the Second World War came to a close in Europe, the trade name Peace was publicly announced on April 29, 1945 by the Conrad Pyle Co. in the United States. Later in 1945, Peace Roses were given to each delegate in the integral meeting of the United Nations in San Francisco with a note that read, We hope the Peace Rose will influence men's thoughts through everlasting world peace. How can we observe Peace Rose Day? Well, that's easy. We can spread the tale of the Peace Rose or perhaps go out and purchase a Peace Rose for yourself. Let us know in the comments section below what you plan to do this National Peace Rose Day. Our next observance is National Zipper Day. National Zipper Day commemorates April 29, 1913, when the patent for the modern zipper was issued. The day celebrates something that we don't often think about and we may automatically take for granted. The first attempt at creating a zipper came from the inventor of the sewing machine in 1851. Elias Howe received a patent for the automatic continuous clothing closure. However, Howe never marketed this invention and missed the recognition he may have received. 42 years later, Woodcomb Judson began selling the clasp blocker, very similar to Elias Howe's patent. This device served as a more complicated hook and eye system as a shoe fastener. Judson started the Universal Fastening Company where he manufactured his new device and debuted it in Chicago World's Fair in 1893. There he met with very little success. Because Judson put his invention before the public for sale, he earned the credit as the creator. In 1906, the Universal Fastening Company also hired Gideon Sundbuck, a Swedish-American electrical engineer. He was highly skilled and known for his devotion to the company. On April 29, 1913, he was granted a patent for the modern zipper, known as the separatable fastener. He submitted the modifications to his invention in 1917. Today we wear a design quite similar to the one Soundback created in his patent. While he may have called them separatable fastener, we know him today as the zipper. By 1923, B.F. Goodrich popularized the word zipper as it applied to the use of boots and pouches. The company even copyrighted the name for a time. That's fascinating. <laughs> That's my zipper day pun. And I bet you're wondering how you can observe National Zipper Day. Well, that's easy. Maybe put on your favorite zip-up sweater, or just appreciate the awesome invention that you take for granted every single day. Let us know in the comment section below if you have something interesting with the zipper on it. Maybe boots, or maybe a hat. Next up on the menu is National Shrimp Scampi Day. National Shrimp Scampi Day on April 29th gives us a tasty way to celebrate. On this day, we honor the delicious dish of shrimp cooked with butter, garlic, lemon juice, and white wine. This day is wholly dedicated to the buttery, garlicky, lemony wine sauce preparation of shrimp. Prepare the dish using frozen or fresh shrimp. When serving the dish, add a side of noodles or rice, steamed vegetables, or crusty bread or rolls. Shrimp scampi pairs well with white wine since the dish is light. A rich dessert of cheesecake or creme brulee rounds out the perfect meal. You don't have to tell me twice to celebrate a scampi day, especially shrimp scampi. Let us know in the comment section below if you've ever had shrimp scampi before. Our final observance is National Poem in Your Pocket Day. During National Poetry Month in April, National Poem in Your Pocket Day shares the way poetry brings joy simply carrying one in your pocket. 
when you share the poem, you'll bring joy to others. There are so many different styles of poetry. This day, however, places no restriction on the rhyme or reason. The goal is simply to share poetry. You may scribble it on a receipt or recite it while walking in line. Add a poem to the back of an envelope on your outgoing mail. Don't be surprised if you discover a poem tucked in a book. You might even find one jotted down on the side of your coffee cup or on the tag on your tea bag. Poems come in so many different sizes they can be squeezed into one square of a calendar or jot on the side of a pencil. No matter where you find them, I'm sure they'll bring a surprise and joy to both you and the person who gets to hear you recite it. What poem would you carry in your pocket, Discovery Learners? Let us know in the comments section below. Go ahead and comment down below and let us know how you plan on observing, well, these observances for today. On this day in history, Today, in 1927, construction of the Spirit of St. Louis, a monoplane which Charles Lindbergh was to fly across the Atlantic, is completed. The Spirit of St. Louis, formerly Ryan NYP, registration at X211, is a custom-built, single-engine, single-seat, high-wing monoplane that was flown by Charles Lindbergh on May 20th to the 21st in 1927 on the first non-stop transatlantic flight from Long Island, New York to Paris, France, for which Lindbergh won $25,000 or TIG prize. Lindbergh took off in the Spirit from Roosevelt Airfield, Garden City, New York, and landed 33 hours and 30 minutes later at Airport de Bourgart in Paris, France, a distance of approximately 3,600 miles. One of the best known aircraft in the world, the Spirit was built by Ryan Airlines in San Diego, California. The Spirit of St. Louis is on permanent display in the main entryways milestone of flight gallery at the Smithsonian Institute of National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. Today, in 1967, Respect, a single by Aretha Franklin, is released. Respect is a song originally released by American singer-songwriter Otis Redding in 1965. The song became a 1967 hit and signature song for our singer Aretha Franklin. The music in the two versions is significantly different and though a few changes in the lyrics, the stories told by the songs have different flavor. Redding's version is a plea from a desperate man who will give his woman anything she wants. He will not care if she does him wrong as long as he gets his due respect when he brings money home. However, in Aretha Franklin's version is a declaration from a strong, confident woman who knows what she wants, who knows that she has everything her man wants. She never does him wrong and demands his respect in the form of appropriate levels of physical attention. Aretha Franklin's version adds R-E-S-P-E-C-T to the chorus and the backup singer's refrain of Sakatimi, Sakatimi, Sakatimi. Also in Aretha Franklin's interpretation of the landmark for the feminist movement, and it was often considered one of the best songs of the R&B era, earning her two Grammy Awards in 1968 for Best Rhythm and Blues recording and the Best Rhythm and Blues solo vocal performance, and was inducted in the Grammy Hall of Fame in 1987. In 2002, the Library of Congress honored Franklin's Virgin by adding the National Recording Registry. It was placed number 5 on the Rolling Stone magazine's list of 500 greatest songs of all time. Go ahead and leave a comment below and let us know what you think of today's historical events. Notable Figures Born on This Day Our first notable figure born today is Duke Ellington. Born April 29th, 1899 in Washington, D.C. This American pianist is one of America's most influential jazz figures. He led his famed orchestra from 1923 until his death. Before he was famous, he was called Duke by his friends growing up because of his suave sophistication reminded them of a nobleman. He unfortunately passed away May 24th of 1974 at the age of 75. But an interesting piece of trivia to know about him is, he called his music American music, 
not jazz. He helped compose more than a thousand original pieces, many of which became standards. Wow, happy birthday Duke Ellington! Another notable figure born today is Willie Nelson. Born April 29, 1933 in Abbott, Texas. This American country singer, activist, poet, songwriter, actor, and author who helped create the farm aid. He has written many country hits, including Funny How Time Slips Away and Hello Walls. Before he was famous, he grew up during the Great Depression and played music for money because he did not want to pick cotton. He wrote his first song when he was only 7 years old. He later signed with Atlantic Records in 1973 and became one of the most recognized faces of country music after appearing in over 30 films, including Barbarossa and The Thief. He turns 88 years old today. Wow, happy birthday Willie Nelson. Another notable figure born today is Jerry Seinfeld. Born April 29, 1954 in Brooklyn, New York. This American stand-up comedian, producer, actor, and writer who co-created and starred in the sitcom Seinfeld, which became one of the most popular television comedies of all time. In 2012, he began his internet comedy series, Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee where he chats with other comedians, tell jokes, while they share a cup of coffee. Before he was famous, he tried out for an open mic night at New York City's Catch a Rising Star after graduating from college. In 1979, he played Frankie, a mailman with obnoxious comedy routines on the sitcom Benson until his director fired him. Uh-oh. But he turns 67 years old today. Wow, happy birthday, Jerry Seinfeld. The next notable figure on our list is Michelle Pfeiffer. Born April 29, 1958 in Santa Ana, California. This American actress starred in Batman Returns, Wolf, and What Lies Beneath. She also appeared in Hairspray and The Witches of Eastwick. Before she was famous, she won Miss Orange County Beauty Pageant in 1978. She starred in some films around that time, but it wasn't until her appearance in the 1983 film Scarface that catapulted her into fame. She turns 63 years old today. Happy birthday, Michelle Pfeiffer! And our last notable figure born today is Uma Thurman. Born April 29, 1970 in Boston, Massachusetts. This American actress is known for her performances in Pulp Fiction and the Kill Bill films. She took home a Golden Globe Award for Best Actress for her role in 2003's Hysterical Blindness. In 2019, she began starring in Netflix's Chambers, as well as served as a producer on the show. Before she was famous, she was incredibly insecure about her body and herself in general, which was prompted by teasing of her classmates. Oh, she also played Medusa in the 2010 film Percy Jackson and the Olympians, The Lightning Thief. She turns 51 years old today. Wow, happy birthday, Uma Thurman. Happy birthday, everyone. Come along, Discovery Learners, and we will see the landmarks of the world. As we continue our journey of discovery throughout Yemen, one of the most exotic countries in the Arabian Peninsula, here are some landmarks you should see, starting with some of their natural wonders, like the Hawk Cave. This large cave is approximately 3 kilometers long, with beautiful stalactites, stalagmites, and endemic cave fauna. In the cave have been found ancient ceramics, cave art, and wooden tablets, with writings that dated from 258 AD. Writings on the wall of the cave have been left by Arabs, Indians, and even Greeks. Whoa, interesting. I wonder what kind of creatures live in that cave. Next on our list is the Rokeb de Birmingham. This is the best and last forest of some of the most unusual looking trees in the world. 
the dragon's blood tree. We actually covered this tree on Monday's episode. One of the most unusual forests in the world is located in Rokeab de Fermenhin, central part of Scotra Island. This is almost pure stand of the dragon blood tree. Legendary trees, which look as if they arrive from a different planet. The dry, isolated Scotra Island has unusual plant and animal life. Out of 825 species on the island, 307 are endemic, which means they're only found in Scotra. The unusual plant life has developed on the island in isolation from the outside world since Menacene, for some 20 million years or longer. Thus, most of the trees on the island are unique, such as several species of frankincense trees, mar trees, desert rose, and the only known wild pomegranate, or cucumber tree. Whoa, and those dragon blood trees are crazy. They look like they're upside down. And not only that, they do look like they belong on an alien planet. An interesting fact about these trees is that they can live up to 650 years. Whoa, that's a long time. Pretty cool. Next on our list is the Great Dam of Marib. One of the engineered wonders of the ancient world, built in the 8th century BC or earlier, the oldest known dam in the world. The original dam was 580 meters long and 4 meters high. Later it became larger. There are also other ancient dams of similar age nearby. The dam has suffered from erosion from the water throughout the years but nevertheless has left a profound influence on the development of South Arabian civilization. Whoa, that's pretty neat. Next up is Old Marib. The ruins of the former Sabine, capital city, that flourished in the first millennium BC, a distinct culture developed here, even with specific writing. Near the city are found ruins of Maharam Bilkis, or Awam Temple, a row of rectangular columns. This temple of the moon god had a huge importance in the region at the time. Oh, those are some interesting looking columns. I wonder what they were used for back in ancient times. Our next stop is an interesting one. It's Al Hajara. Al Hajara is a fortified medieval village perched on a cliffside in the Haraz Mountains. Built in the 12th century, these ornate houses are built over the abyss and look very impressive. They're also built on a cliff face. This is really cool. It kind of looks like a video game landscape. Kind of like Prince of Persia, if you've ever played that game before. The next landmark is the Al Amiria Mosque, which is actually one of the most ornate mosques in this region. Constructed in 1504, this large structure is rectangular, adorned with six large domes. And what is especially impressive are the Peña frescoes inside the geometric and floral motifs in exceptionally high quality. Wow, what a mosque! Pretty neat! Next we have the Shahara Bridge. An old and impressive bridge that was built over 300 meters deep into a canyon around the 17th century. Wow, that bridge is pretty cool. It almost looks as if it was carved into the mountainside. And it looks pretty steep. Like I said earlier, Yemen is a very exotic country and is considered one of the jewels of the Arabian Peninsula with its medieval cities, archaeological monuments, and the natural wonders of Scotra Island such as the dragon blood trees. And with that being said, Yemen is a very interesting country with lots to see. Unfortunately, we do not have time to see it all, but what we did see was pretty spectacular. Now be sure to stay tuned for tomorrow's episode as we go over some more tidbits you should know about Yemen, here on Ability to Learn. Here's the animal of the day. Today's animal is the peacock. Most people use the term peacock to describe both male and female birds, but the peacock is actually a name that refers to the male peafowl. Peafowls belong to the pheasant family. These birds are native to Asia, and there are two species of the peafowl, the Indian peafowl and the green peafowl. Both types are endangered because of the habitat loss, smuggling, and predation. 
The male peafowl is called a peacock, while the female is called a peahen. They are one of the largest flying birds. Their length, including their tail, can reach up to 5 feet, and they can weigh between 8 and 13 pounds. They are omnivorous, which means they eat both plants and animals. They like to eat insects, arthropods, amphibians, flowers, and seeds. Their main predators are tigers, leopards, mongoose. When they sense danger, they fly and hide in the trees. They spend nights in trees for that same reason. A family of peafowl is called a bevy. A group of peafowl is called a party. The beautiful colorful tails you associate with peacocks are characteristic only for the males. The colors of their tail will look differently every time you change the angle of looking at them. Because of the reflection of the light, the tail feathers have an eye-shaped spot surrounded with green, red, gold, and red feathers. The tail makes up to 60% of the peacock's total length. A peahen chooses its partner by the length and width and the coloration of the tail of the peacock. Although they are very beautiful, a peacock produces a very unpleasant sound. Females lay three to five eggs. The young birds will hatch after 28 days. One day old baby peafowls can walk, eat, and drink without assistance. A peafowl can live up to 20 years in both the wild or captivity. That's interesting. I knew that the peacocks were all males, but I didn't know a female peacock was called a peahen. Did you learn any new interesting facts about peacocks? Let us know in the comment section below. So what do you think of today's animal? Is it cute? Is it creepy? Go ahead and let us know what you think in the comment section below. The plant of the day. Today's plant is sage. Sage is an evergreen plant. There are numerous species of sage that are native to the Mediterranean region. Sage grows in the form of a bush. It prefers warm climates and dry soil. Sage can be found in habitats to provide enough sunlight, such as meadows and fields. Many of types of sage are cultivated throughout the world. This plant is mostly used as a spice and remedy. People have been using the healing properties of sage at least a couple thousand years. Among numerous disorders, recent medical studies indicate that sage has the potential to treat Alzheimer's disease. Sage is also cultivated because of its ornamental morphology. Sage has a woody stem that can reach two feet high. Sage leaves develop white, purple, pink, or more commonly lavender colored flowers. The flowers are pollinated by various types of insects, usually by honeybees. People have been using sage as a flavoring agent for at least 2,000 years. Sage has a savory and peppery taste. It is often used with dishes made of beans, cheese, tomatoes, and eggs. Leaves and flowers contain different types of components, chemically known as flavonoids, which exhibit anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, and antifungal, and antiseptic properties. Sage facilitates digestion and eliminates the excess of water from the body. Basically, it acts as diuretic. Tonics made of sage can improve growth of hair, and they're often used in the treatment of alopecia. Sage has been used as a meat preservative in ancient Greece and Rome because it possesses antibacterial properties. Ancient Romans used sage for the treatment of a sore throat, bleeding wounds, snake bites, hot flushes, and ulcers. Sage was also used as a memory enhancer. Sage is an important part of traditional Chinese medicine during the past couple thousand years. This plant increases the body's strength, mental capacity, and body heat. Native Americans use sage leaves to treat sores on the skin and to heal swollen gums. Fresh leaves or juices squeezed from the leaves can be used to soothe insect bites. Sage can stimulate appetite when it's used in combination with dandelion or artichoke. One species of sage, known as salvia, exhibits strong psychoactive properties. Sage is a perennial plant, which means it can survive more than two years in the wild. That's super interesting, and here I just like to put it on my food. Did you learn anything cool about sage? Let us know in the comment section below. It's that time again. We just learned about a new plant. So go ahead and tell us what you think in the comment section below. And now for the word of the day. Today's word is repertoire. It's a noun. It means a stock of plays dances, or pieces that a company or performer knows or is prepared to perform. The whole body of items which are regularly performed. A stock of skills, 
or types of behavior that a person habitually uses. Repertoire. Our next word is a word you may have heard somewhere in today's episode. The word is interfere. It's a verb. It means take part or intervene in an activity without invitation or necessity to prevent a process or activity from continuing or being carried out properly. Interfere. Let's take a look at the art of the day. Today's art is Yemenite silversmithing. Yemenite silversmithing refers to the work of Jewish silversmiths from Yemen. They were highly acclaimed craftsmen who dominated the craft production in precious metals in the southern Arabian Peninsula from the 18th century to the 20th century, a period and region during which Muslims did not engage in this work. These Yemite silversmiths were noted for their use of fine granulation and filigree, producing such ornaments as women's bracelets and necklaces. This trade was almost held exclusively by Jews living in a traditional Yemeni society, which were active around at least as far back as the mid-1700s. The largest clientele for the jewelry made of gold or silver were women, and the amount of jewelry worn was often an indicator of women's status. Some Yemenite silversmiths migrated to Israel in the late 1800s, a migration that continued into the early 1900s. Yemenite silver work is noted for its intricate use of filigree and fine granulation. Jewelry containing a high silver content was called by local Jews as to'or, or in the Arabic tongue, malas. The intent of being the jewelries whose silver content ranged from 85% to 92% sterling silver, while the rest being copper. Silver jewelry from this particular region is known for its intricacy and impressive complexity. And do not forget that the more jewelry a woman had, the higher the status she would have. Each of these pieces are handmade in their own unique styles. Some styles and patterns were passed down along family generations to generation, making this an ancient work of art. Here is today's interesting fact. Did you know that our sun is actually the color white and not yellow? It's true. The color of our sun is white. The sun emits all colors of the rainbow more or less evenly and in physics, we call this combination white. That is why we can see so many different colors in the natural world under the illumination of our sunlight. Now let's say for example that the sunlight was purely green, then everything outside would look green or dark. We can see the redness of a rose and the blueness of a butterfly's wing under our sunlight because sunlight contains red and blue light. The same goes for all other colors. When a light bulb engineer designs a bulb that is supposed to mimic the sun, therefore provide natural illumination, he designs a white light bulb, not a yellow bulb. The fact that you see all fundamental colors present in the rainbow, which is actually sunlight split by mist, and no colors are missing is direct evidence that sunlight is white. Now that's in regards to visible light that humans can see. We see different colors of the rainbow, but other colors in that spectrum are invisible to the human eye, such as infrared, x-ray, radio, gamma, and microwaves along the spectrum. Those are the type of light waves that we cannot see. So I guess you're asking, why does the sun look yellow then? That's because of our atmosphere. The different gases such as oxygen and nitrogen and carbon dioxide in our atmosphere change the color of the sun. So yeah, the color of our sun is actually white. Pretty interesting, huh? Yes, cue the credits. This means we have reached the end of today's episode of Ability to Learn. 
I had fun and I hope you had fun too. But not only had fun, I hope you learned something as well. So farewell Discovery Learners, Teacher Liz here is saying thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Don't forget to attend the live Zoom sessions provided to you every day by the Discovery Day Program's educational team. Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you're notified for all the fun here on Ability to Learn from the Discovery Day Program.